Thanks, Lisa. Happy Mother's Day. It is uh, a blessing to be here this morning to worship with you all uh, together. I uh, hope that life is going well for you. And if it is or if it isn't, it's good you're here today because I believe God has a word for you and for me uh, this morning to impact our lives. One of the most, before I uh, start the sermon and while the little ones uh, head on their way, uh, one of the things I want to mention is you all know one of the most important things we can do is prepare the next generation to know Jesus and love Jesus and be equipped to share Jesus with others. And that being the case, there's one right now, uh, that being the case, um, our children's ministry directors have brought up to my attention that there are lots of opportunities still available to help out with Vacation Bible Adventure. Uh, in other in other words, if you could uh, contact either Tracy or Ruth, or if you don't know Tracy and Ruth, just contact our church office. And um, there's stuff behind the scenes. There's uh, stuff during the Monday through Friday. You might be able to help out all five days or just a couple days. But it really helps now if you can kind of kind of commit and say, hey, this is where I can help out so that we don't, uh, so, you know, the more they can plan in advance. Last year we had, what, we have 200 children. And this year we're expecting that many or even more. And so it's just a lot of kids takes a lot of effort. I know you all know this, and I'm guessing most of not all of us here are thinking, yeah, I'm going to help out, but maybe just haven't signed up yet. And so if you could do that, that would really help the ministry here for that, that important ministry. Today, we're continuing the sermon series on through the book of Ephesians, with the emphasis being, what does it mean to be the church? As God spoke through the apostle Paul, and he wrote this letter, he's saying, this is what it means to actually be the church. And today, we're looking at a portion of, of chapter two. Um, I want to encourage you before next Sunday, read through Ephesians 3. Just take you a couple minutes, read through it a couple times, because if you do that, then when you uh, come and hear, and actually Ethan Morris, uh, Ken Cecil's son-in-law, is going to be here next week presenting a portion of uh, Ephesians chapter 3. So come kind of ready to hear what uh, God is going to say through him for that. Uh, today again is chapter 2, and I, I uh, made the subtitle uh, being raised from the dead. And, and then here's the main point for today's uh, message is this God's saving love God's saving love is a gift uh, you don't have to do good things so that God will love you and as obvious as that seems so many people uh, haven't embraced that yet and so we have to embrace that as a church so we can demonstrate what it means to live with the freedom found and knowing that God's saving love is a gift the key verses this morning are from verse 8 and 9 of chapter 2 and, and you know so this is just two verses and y'all will just kind of engage here would you read these with me this morning so here we go for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Well, there we go. Let's pray. God, as we gather this morning, we thank you, Lord, for this another day that you've given us. And today we're especially mindful, Lord, of the, of the role of mothers in the life of our families and our communities. And we thank you, Lord. We know some, uh, we all had mothers that are imperfect in some way and some may have done a better job than others but lord we're just so thankful for as uh, as laura said the many ways that they extend love and sometimes too often are not thanked and so this morning let it be that we gather together and say thank you for these women who have uh, who play such a vital role in the life of marriages families uh, churches communities in the world jesus we pray this in your holy name amen so yeah definitely happy mother's day you know one of the things that kind of came up just a couple weeks ago that i wasn't quite expecting my own mother is here with us today so hi mom not to put you on the spot but we're glad you're here can y'all welcome her today Love you, glad you're here. Dad's here as well, so it's a blessing. Uh, Mom and, and my wife Beth went yesterday to a bridal shower over in Columbus. Our second son, Craig, is getting married in November. I get to conduct the service. That's going to be pretty cool in Columbus. And they had a bridal shower yesterday, so that brought them here. But um, I, know, uh, I know Mom and Dad can remember some years ago, before some of you existed, but not all of you, 1965 to 1968, we lived in Fostoria, Ohio. Anyone here know where Fostoria, Ohio? Ohio is anyone all right all right there's a few just slightly northeast of Finley a little ways you go up 75 there I was uh, I was age five to eight during that time and one memory I remember I, I went to field elementary school 
And in second grade, oh yeah, recently I drove through Fostoria and Field Elementary School has lived up to its name. It's literally a field now. There's no building there. But there used to be. There used to be. And one day when I was in second grade playing on the playground before we had all the safety rules, you can see there, um, uh, all of a sudden a, a shadow came looming over me and I looked up and there was the dreaded Mrs. Muma. I remember that name, Mrs. Muma, fourth grade teacher. You wanted to stay in the good graces of Mrs. Muma or just stay away from her. She must have been on playground duty that day. And she says to me, she looks at me and says, so, Sonnenberg, huh? Are you as smart as your older brother? And I, you know, today I might say, is this a multiple choice question? But I just kind of like shrug my shoulders and she goes, well, I guess we'll see. Whew. The next year, by the grace of God, we moved from Fostoria <laughs> to Columbia, Tennessee. Thank you, Jesus. And, but you know that question, are you as smart as your older brother? For some reason, that got re-put re in one of the recesses of my brain that hits play over and over and over again. And it began to repeat. And so, and the way it kind of developed was this way. Oh, if I perform well, then I gain people's approval. If I do things well, then people will love me. Sometimes we call this people-pleasing. Um, and uh, maybe uh, some of you all can relate to it. Now, the, the good news is today, you, whether it's today, or in these days ahead, if you, some, if you hear someone at Bethany say, you know, Doug did this, and I am not pleased at all, what you can respond with is, praise God, he's getting better. <laughs> right? Right? Think about it. Maybe, maybe not. Okay. <laughs> you know, I wonder, I'm not uh, the only one that has wrestled with this a bit in life, but perhaps some of you can relate to, uh, um, to, relate to this idea in fact, let me ask, have you ever felt like you had to perform a certain way in order to gain someone's approval or someone's love? Maybe it was a grandparent or a parent. Maybe it was an in-law. Maybe it was a teacher. Maybe a boyfriend or a girlfriend, a spouse, sometimes even a grown child, that you feel like, well, I've got to act a certain way. I've got to perform a certain way so that they'll still approve of me, so that they'll still love me. And you know, the thing about this is it can be emotionally exhausting because each day you wonder, am I doing okay? Is he, does he still love me? Is, does she still uh, approve of me? Let me ask you another question. What about gaining God's approval? Getting his love? Have you ever felt like you had to perform at a certain level in order to gain God's approval? You know how it goes, if I do enough good things, if I behave well enough, that God will give me a thumbs up. Way to go. <laughs> there he is right there. I don't know if there's some movie or something, but there's a lot of those creepy figures on Google. When you Google, God thumbs up. But well, there's Jesus saying, hey man, I love you, you're doing well. But there, there's a problem with living this way, and this is, this is a big difference than living with the understanding that God's saving love is a gift, right? That you don't have to do good things so that, order, so that God will love you, a big difference. And the, and the problem with, li with living in this kind of performance mode with God is each day you may wonder, how am I doing? Am I, am I doing okay? Did I, did I make the grade? Um, I mean, you hope so, and you think so, but, but you're never entirely sure. In fact, I think it'd be fair to say we've created an entire culture on what I call the, the false gospel. And, and here's what the false gospel looks like. It goes something like this. If I am a good person, God will be pleased with me, and, when I, and I will go to heaven when I die, right? If I'm a good person, God will be pleased with me, and I'll go to heaven when I die. You know anyone that kind of lives that way? I think, I think it'd be fair to say a lot of people, even those that consider themselves Christians, say, yeah, that's, yeah that's, that's the basic idea. How many funerals have you been to where you say, he was a good man, or she, she was a good person? And there's nothing wrong with that. They, they probably were good people. But it seems like underlying that is, therefore, if they're just good enough, that they'll go to heaven when they die. But here's one of, one of the things that kind of looms over that, is what's the scale? I mean, who determines 
Like, what's the bad end, what's the good end? Now, in the 20th century, we have an easy one for the bad end, right? Hitler, right? Basically, everyone knows Hitler, man. When you want to say, oh, man, oh, man, that guy, that guy whoo, he's, he's bad. Hitler, we're there. Now, some of my friends, the real history buffs, uh, like to kind of argue that there's other people, I don't know, Mussolini or whoever. I'm like, okay, whatever, yeah, you, you, and you're probably even right, but the general populace says, Hitler, man, he's the bad one. So, all right, that's one end of the scale, because I know I'm not as bad as he was, at least not so far. But you go to the other end, and who's on the good end of the scale? And you're thinking, what? Mother Teresa, Billy Graham. I mean, those aren't bad, right? They, they were pretty good, but really, they're, they're not even close, because really the other end of the scale, I mean, kind of the obvious answer would be who? Starts with a J. Jesus, yeah, yeah, he's the other end of the scale. It's like, okay, we got Hitler, we got Jesus, all right. So if I just perform good enough, I get to, you know, when, when eternity comes, I get to be with Jesus, not Hitler. But the question is, where's the line? Where's the line? I mean, and where am I on that line? I mean, is it like the, the PGA Tour? Those of you who are not golfers, don't worry. So we, we, we welcome you, we embrace you. Um, and yeah, and I know, I'm working on that one too, but... In case you don't know, each weekend in the professional golf tour, they play Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And after Friday's round, after two rounds, there's what they call the cut. And so let's say, for example, and then they take all the players and they look somewhere in the middle there. There's some formula. I don't know what it is. You can ask my dad. He'll know what the cut is. But let's say the cut is minus two under par. So if you played better than two under par, three under par, four under par, you're in. You play Saturday, Sunday. But if you happen to have a couple of bad days on Thursday or Friday and you, and you play worse than two under par, then you don't make the cut and you don't get to play on Saturday and Sunday. You head on to the next tournament. And so what if, I mean, is that what it is? As far, if, we, if we just do enough good things, we make the cut somewhere between Hitler and Jesus? I mean, can you imagine coming before the Lord and go, what? What? I gossiped one too many times about my neighbor? Are you serious? I mean, wait, 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 wait. What about the compassion child that we've been sponsoring now for years? I mean, that's not cheap, you know. And not only that, what about all those fundraisers where, you know, do you know how many cheese Danish mixed nuts and flowers I've bought? I don't even like mixed nuts, but so that my neighbor kid can get a baseball uniform or the neighbor girl can go to summer camp. I mean, what do you mean I gossiped one too many times? I didn't make the cut. What's that all about? You know, fortunately for us today, we're not the only ones that have kind of wondered about this. Way back in the first century, people were asking the same type questions. How good is good enough for God? In fact, the little booklet that we have at our Welcome Center for first time guests, Andy Stanley talks about that, how good is good enough? And today in Ephesians chapter two, we're gonna just look at 10 verses that, uh, that address this question that brings about the reality that it's not a matter of being good enough. God's saving love is a gift. So I've divided it into three sections. We're gonna kind of talk through it. Now, hang with me as far as the bad news, the walking to this first paragraph is kind of the bad news. Sometimes people have said, man, you, you get me so down, I can't listen to the rest. Well, hang in there because there's always good news. There's every week, there should be good news. So here's the bad news as Paul writes to this church about what it means to be the church. He says, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once, once walked. And, and the people even then might say, what do you mean I'm I'm dead, I'm living, I'm breathing, I'm eating, I'm sleeping, I'm, I'm awake. Well, we're talking about your spiritual life here. Because in life, we're spiritual beings that now have a physical body, but our spiritual life will go on after this life. And you either go on to a path of darkness and death or to a path of life. And Paul says, you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. And he says, here's what I mean by that. You were following the course of this world. He's saying the way the world naturally goes is in opposition to how God wants you to live. We get examples every day. 
I mean, I won't go into all the details, but I'm guessing you're somewhat familiar with recently, some politicians in New York State and Virginia had conversation about the value or not of a child even when they're born. I mean, I'm just like, I can't believe we're even having this conversation. Well, that's called following the course of this world. Following the prince of the power of the air. That's probably the nicest title in the Bible for Satan, uh, the devil, the evil one. So following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience or children of disobedience. Jesus said, if you love me, in John 14, 15, he says, if you love me, obey my commands. That's how you express your love for Jesus. You obey my commands. And so Paul's saying, you all were living as sons and daughters of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions. He says, here's how it kind of plays out. The passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. I have certain desires. And if I ignore and say, I just want to do my desires, rather than, well, what has God said about the desires and how I follow through on those or not? He says, you were just carrying them out. And the mind, and we're by nature children of wrath or punishment. Whose who's punishment or wrath? Of God's wrath or punishment. Just like the rest of all mankind. But the good news is this. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us. Now catch the timing on this. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. It's saying that regardless of the stuff you were doing, good or bad, God just loved you. He just loved you. And he looked down at the world and said, because I love you, I'm gonna make you alive in Christ. I'm gonna send my son. He'll set the example of what it means to live as a son of obedience. He'll pay the price on the cross for all of our sins and trespasses so that you, if you receive what he's done, then you can be made alive together with him by grace. That means undeserved love. You've been saved and raised up with him into everlasting life rather than death, and seated us with him in the heavenly places. I mean, there's a literal banquet hall in heaven that's being prepared. And when you receive God's gift of saving love through Jesus Christ, a little name card is put at your seat uh, that says, when your time on earth comes to a close, you've got a seat at Christ's heavenly banquet. It's gonna be a party like, uh, unlike any other parties. So that in the coming ages, he, meaning God, might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. So that people can look and say, wow, God was so kind and, and that it, he extended this gift of love. And that brings us to the verses we started with today. For by grace, you've been saved through faith. It's not your own doing. It's the gift of God. It's not a result of works so that no one may boast. God knows that if he did make this, this system with a cut somewhere, that those who made it would start bragging about it and get arrogant. So that's not the case. For we are his workmanship. In other words, God made us. He created us in Christ Jesus. And he did create us to do good things, good works. He prepared them beforehand that we should walk in them. And so catch this this morning. God's saving love is a gift. Does God want us to do good things? Of course he does. But he doesn't want us to go through life trying to do enough good things so that we get his approval, we make the cut, we go into heaven. He said, forget all that. Here's my love in Jesus Christ. Just receive it. And then, then do the good things that I want you to do. You know, I said earlier that um, we had that false gospel. God wants us to be freed of that. That false gospel that says, if I'm a good person, God will be pleased with me, and I will go to heaven when I die. Jesus said, there's no one good but God, which would include Jesus. But here's the true gospel this morning, and I just want you to hear this. Based on Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, here's the true gospel, what God's telling us. It goes something like this. I wasn't a good person, but God loved me anyway. He reached out to save me, and when I took his hand, something in me changed. And I realized I could never have earned his love. I didn't have to. He was giving it away. Now, I want to do good things with God, 
for God today, tomorrow, forever. Thanks, God. Thank you. This morning, um, I want to give you the opportunity if, if you want to experience this closeness with God and just know, you know what? I could never measure up to be Jesus myself. And God is saying you don't have to. I want to invite you this morning. We're going to go back one slide. Can we go back one slide? And I just want to invite us, anyone here, and I hope that's everyone, just to say thank you, God, and to read this together. This is the story of your life because it's certainly the story of mine. Let's read this together. Here we go. I wasn't a good person, but God loved me anyway. He reached out to save me, and when I took his hand, something in me changed. I realized I could never have earned his love. I didn't have to. He was giving it away. Now I want to do good things with God, for God, today, tomorrow, forever. Thanks, God. Thanks. Imagine a world, imagine a world where every boy and girl, every man and woman realized that and received that. Can you imagine the freedom from anxiety, from anger, just knowing that God loves me, he changes me, and then I want to do good things. Well, imagine a church that says the, the world hasn't got this yet. And so we're going to be in a church where every boy and girl, every man and woman was, is secure in this knowledge. Imagine that. The, a church where every person here knew God's peace and, and this security that is saving love is a gift. I don't have to earn it. Think how this would begin to impact marriages and families and friends at school and, and co-workers and bosses and employees. No more frustration of trying to be a good person by doing enough good things. Instead, knowing that God loves me, I just want to do them out of a thankful heart. We, as disciples and disciple makers, we call this living in thankful obedience. As we know that God's saving love is a gift. You don't have to do good things to earn his love. Well, as we wrap this up this morning in prayer, I want you to just really just think about this this morning because we all have our baggage in life and God is saying, I'm well aware of that. And you know what? I love you. And I want you to be freed from the guilt of that. That's why I sent Jesus. So let's pray this morning. And I bet each and every one of us know of friends, family members, others that would just be blessed to be able to live this way. Well, let's, um, you know, God says when two or three are gathered, there I am among you. Well, let's, let's join together for our friends and family makers and ask God to, to help them to see this. And maybe he's going to use us as instruments of his grace to just talk about it as far as, as, far as that goes. And, and for those who are, who are still striving, striving to perform well, to receive love, and, and you do have people in your life that just don't seem to be able to approve of you unless you do certain things just be free that the foundation of your life is the one above who knows you and he loves you just for who you are let that be your foundation the people of this world as much as we love them don't let them be the one that directs your self-worth God saying I'm the one that created you I'm the one that determines your value so with that in mind let's take a moment this morning and just ask for the Holy Spirit to bless us this way. Let's pray. If y'all want to kneel, you can, or at your chair, whatever you want to do. Let's just take a moment and pray. God, as we come before you today, Lord, we're praying this morning that we would be freed of the things that may bind us, freed of, of, a, of a way of thinking and being that is, is destructive and, and, and discouraging. 
And so, Lord, help us uh, with this idea of having to perform or do things in a certain way, Lord, that in order to gain someone's approval, let, let's just let that go. And this morning, Lord, we hold your words of truth for grace. By grace, you have been saved through faith. Not by anything we've done. It's a gift of God. And so this morning, Holy Spirit, come and pour into the hearts and minds this gift of God to each man and woman here, each boy and girl, that we would begin to realize more clearly what it means and that we are loved beyond measure by the Father in heaven who created us and gave us life by the one who sent his son Jesus to pay the price for any of the junk in our life. Lord, let it be this morning that we receive that. And we know we're a, we're a beloved child of God. And then, Lord, we also pray this morning for friends or family members or co-workers or who are, who are even who might be tormented by the inability to be released from this lord we believe in jesus name through the power of the holy spirit you can release them and so we pray lord that they would receive the the, the knowledge that their love because of who they are and in a god that sends that love and lord if if you're going to use us as mouthpieces to have conversations conversations then lord help us just to trust in you and to demonstrate i love you just because of who you are help us lord again to live as the people that demonstrate we are far from perfect but the reason we have joy and peace and love in our hearts and in our actions is just because we know it's by grace we've been saved that god's saving love is a gift we praise you, Jesus. We thank you so much. Thank you this morning for the chance to be here. Bless mothers and fathers and sons and daughters. All in your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.